Hey everybody, chapter four of Pagoo, at the ringside. So here is the little tidal pool he's at. Pagoras was worried. For weeks he had been drifting near the surface of the sea and now he walked on the bottom. He had settled down through the water when a wave had come ashore and he, he blundered along the floor of a tide pool in a fearful hurry. With one eye cocked at the watery shadows, the other aimed at another wave rolling above, he scuttled under a hill of rock the size of a duck egg. Somewhere nearby, their waves were pounding the rocky coast. It was not the coast that worried Pagu. He had long forgotten his horrible bout with the tide, the surf, and the shore. He was a shore creature now, and the push-and-pull tides would be his friends. For hours, he would live under several feet of salt water while waves rolled out the old gray ocean to pass over him and crash on the rocks beyond. For other hours, he would have a quiet, shallow, sun-warm pool to play in. It was not the changing six-hour shifts, nor the shallow, deep, shallow, tidal rhythm that bothered him. Pugu was simply nervous about his rubbery rear. So helpless and exposed, he backed farther under the stone to hide himself. As Pugu pressed back, a sea worm wiggled under his corkscrew tail. Pagoo's jump was automatic, almost as high as a hot cake in a thick old. Oh, and old pal was yelling, find another hiding spot. So Pagoo, just a dark little dot with legs all spraddled, dashed out from under the stone. As he scurried, his toes touched sand, and he heard, dig in. So he squirmed backwards, leaving only his eyes and feelers sticking out. Pagoo was breathing heavily. A current of water swished over his gills under his armor, giving him a new breath. Oxygen filtered out of the water like an unseen fog, passed through the gills, and soaked into his blood. Pagu always would need oxygen. There were hermit cousins he had never met who could take oxygen from the air itself, so he could live on the dry beach or the water either way. Pagu could, too, for a short time. And there's a good picture of Pagu now. But and. Less his stranded pool grew stale and much too salty. He would prefer taking his oxygen from sparkling, churning seawater. Between his two long feelers, other feathery feelers were clawing and whipping the water, setting food flecks to jiggling before his eyes. Pagoo was again reminded that he lived in a kettle of excellent soup, which sometimes thickened into a regular stew. He was still small enough to enjoy the soup, and he raked tiny particles into his mouth. There were diatom and algae vegetables, as always, an animal too small for you to see. Also torn shreds of seaweed. He found meatballs floating in from some far-off meal. Pugu was eating well, but still he was feeding as he had fed when he was a baby at the surface. Now he was a hermit crab youngster on sea bottom. Wasn't there some new way of eating? He heaved himself up and propped his new claws on the sand. Were these things good only to fold under and flop under his body when he walked? These two new gadgets could open and shut. They could pinch. He stared at them, hearing, Try em, son. They're mighty handy tools. And all of a sudden, Pagoo was busy as a sailor who had just learned how to handle chopsticks. Pagoo laid a call on top of a pebble, opened it, closed it, and pointed it in his mouth. To you, the pebble, pebble might have looked smooth in the water. It was all covered with algae growth. Pagoo had no, grown known algae since babyhood in fine floating diatom size. Down here it came also in filmy coatings or fuzzy like velvet or soft and deep as moss. In fact, the real seaweeds, from tender leafy sea lettuce up to tough kelp plants a hundred feet long, were all algae. But Pagoo was not interested in big seaweed algae. He preferred to hunt food in the fuzzy algae on the pebble. His claws opened and shut, and he ate greedily, pleased with his new scissor pincher plucker tools. Then a couple of somethings whirled from nowhere and plopped near Pagoo. They flopped around, and Pagoo shrank back, fearing a blow. But nothing happened. Mud cloud spurted and drifted off in watery haze, and he wasn't hurt. He was frightened. And he tried backing further into the sand, but his tender tail struck solid rock below. Pagoo kept still, except for his quivering feelers and his jerking eyes. 
he heard an old instinct as though tuned in from a vast distance and from an ancient time. Those two strangers standing before you, they're hermit crabs. They were big fellows, each of them 12 times the size of small pagoo. How big is that in terms of people? Well, if you were a six-foot man, which is doubtful, then a building 12 times your height would be about seven stories tall. So compared to tiny Pagoras, those two hermits were as big as barns. Pigou did not go racing out to his newfound relatives, waving a welcome. He was as still as stone. The tig big bruisers stood glaring at each other, legs wide, arms out, gloves ready. As though Pigou had watched boxing bouts a million years back in his memory, there seemed nothing that strange at all, nor in the fighting costumes. With helmeted heads and shoulders forward, their tender tails were curled inside brown boxing trunks. They were old snail shells, over an inch wide. Shell layers, worn off by surf, had left them many-colored. Now the fighters sidestepped, dragged their shells along, rumpity-bump. They darted out on pointed toes, drawing back, weaving. What well-matched specimens of the water arena, such graceful sparring. Now they rush together, gloves swinging, they jab and jab again, and they counter with small crosses. Their uppercuts start low from the very bottom of the sea. Now they go into a clinch. Sand and mud swirled like a cigar smoke over the whole area. As Pagoo stared goggle-eyed at the ringside, both boxers slammed into him. Their heavy shells rolled over him, banged his feelers and claws, and hammered his tender body hidden under the sand. Pagoo. Chapter 4